Hello, statistics students. We finished up our chapter on confidence intervals. Now we're going to start a chapter on hypothesis testing. I find hypothesis testing to be one of the coolest things we do in statistics. So let's talk about where we've been and where we're going. So in our last chapter, we were doing confidence intervals and hence we were estimating either a population mean or a population proportion. We took a point estimate, which was either X bar or P hat, and we created an interval. And we were C confident that our interval contained the parameter. So our point estimate was right in the middle of the interval. interval and we did that point estimate plus the margin of error and minus the margin of error. And we were fairly confident at a confidence level of C that that interval contained the parameter. Now in this chapter and all succeeding chapters, we're not gonna try to estimate the parameter. We're not gonna try to estimate the population mean or um, proportion. We're going to test a hypothesis about it. Is the mean greater than 72? Is the mean proportion um, greater than 50%? In other words, I got a poll out there that shows candidate A is polling at 49%. What does that mean? I mean they're gonna lose the election? What's it mean? So we're going to test a hypothesis about a parameter. And to start with, we need to create two hypotheses. This is very important. You've got to understand these and the difference between them. The first is the null hypothesis written H sub zero. The other is the alternative hypothesis, sometimes written H sub A and sometimes written H sub one. You'll see both in them statistics textbooks. They mean the same thing. So the null hypothesis is what you are hoping to prove false. And for our purposes right now, this will change a little bit later, <clears throat> but for right now, your null hypothesis will always, always, always have an equal sign in it. It may be equals, it may be less than or equals, or it may be greater than or equals, but a null hypothesis always, always, always has an equal sign in it in some form. Now, later we're gonna use, to write null hypotheses in words, not formulas. You say, well, then it doesn't have an equal sign. Well, in words, it kind of will. And your null hypothesis usually contains a statement about your parameter. In other words, is mu greater than 50? Greater than or equal to 50? if it's my null hypothesis, because I always want to have an equal sign in it. The alternative hypothesis is what we're hoping to prove. And notice I put prove in quote marks. We never really prove, we just gather more, we just collect more and more evidence in support of the alternative hypothesis. And the alternative is usually the complement to the null. <coughs> So if the null hypothesis is mu is less than or equal to 50, then the alternative would be mu is greater than 50. And again, um, talking about a parameter mu, and it's gotta be a strict inequality. One of these three signs in the alternative hypothesis. Our goal is to gather enough evidence in favor of the alternative such that we can reject the null and conclude that the alternative is true. We want to reject the null, conclude that the alternative is true. That doesn't mean that we prove the alternative. And if we don't collect enough evidence here, that doesn't mean that we prove the null. We never prove the null. Semantically, we just didn't get enough evidence to reject it. So let me put that in other terms. Our goal in hypothesis testing is to reject the null and conclude that the alternate is true. Failing that, the only other thing that can happen 
is that we don't have enough evidence to reject the null or to accept the alternative. Rejecting the null means you accept the alternative. If we don't have enough evidence to do that, doesn't mean we accept the null. Mm -mm. Never, ever, ever write that. Lose many points for that. We just fail to reject the null. And then we can go to our Lee Kuchera handout. And see how we should word this in problems. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you do not have enough evidence to conclude the alternate is true. We do not have sufficient evidence at the such and such level, and we'll talk about those percentages, to support the alternative hypothesis. Or, and there's a thing called a p-value, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, you could say at a, a p-value of this, we do not have a sufficient evidence to support the alternative. If you reject the null hypothesis, at whatever level of significance, there is sufficient evidence to support the alternative. So you'll notice that in both cases, we're talking about the alternative. Either you reject the null and conclude the alternative is true, or you fail to reject the null and say there is not enough evidence to support the alternative. And we'll talk about some variations on those statements as time goes on. So let's look at an example. I think the average amount of money that students carry at Rio in their pockets is about is more than $25. So that's what I want to prove. So I make that my alternative. So my null would be either mu is less than or equal to 25, or you could just say mu is equal to 25. Because if I don't prove this, I failed in my mission anyway, no matter which of these is the case. So my procedure is going to be, once I've written my hypotheses, and you always, always, always write your hypotheses before you gather data, we're going to take a simple random sample, we're going to calculate X bar, and we're going to use some information about the central limit theorem and the sampling distribution, which we learned previously. And we're going to draw a conclusion. Do I have sufficient evidence based on this sample to conclude this is true or do I not? <clears throat> so in that handout, I mentioned a p-value. P, of course, stands for probability. And it is vitally important, not that you memorize this definition, but that you understand what a p-value is and what it tells us. So what is the probability of getting the sample results I got or something more extreme, assuming the null hypothesis is true? So in my previous problem, the null hypothesis was mu is less than or equal to 25. So I, the reason we always put an equal sign in the null is that tells me where to center my normal curve. If the normal curve is centered down here, you know, and it peaks over here, well then in this number here, that's gonna be a very small area under the curve if the curve peaks here and then goes down. So we're gonna move the curve as far to the right as possible, which would be equal to 25. And let's say I got this X bar. So my um, sample was, I don't know, what, 26 bucks, whatever it happens to be on this curve. And I want to know, what is the probability of getting the sample results I got, so that $26, or something more extreme, which means further from the mean, assuming the null is true? In other words, assuming that the average is 25, what's the probability that I'd get a sample of 26 or more? I do wanna show you something. If you write your hypothesis like this, you notice how it's mu is greater than 25 is my high, um, alternative? That means I shade to the right. Mu is greater than 25, I'm shading to the right. 
what if my sample was 24? And you say, well, uh, more extreme. Well, I would still shade to the right. But on the other hand, if you got a sample, if you're trying to prove that mu is greater than 25 and you got a sample of 24, not a lot of evidence in support of your alternative hypothesis, is it? So this is, we can stick with this knowing that if you got a mu X bar down here, if we're, I mean, that's not any evidence that's gonna support your claim anyway. So we'll stick with something more extreme. Assuming I got an X bar greater than 25, it's this area under the curve. This area is my p-value. This is the probability of getting the results I got or something more extreme, assuming the curve is centered where it says it's centered in the null hypothesis. You must know these three points of a p-value. It's the probability of getting the results you got or something more extreme, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So what we're doing <clears throat> in these hypothesis tests is really a proof, proof by contradiction. We're assuming the null hypothesis is true, then we're gathering mathematical evidence against it. And how much of it, what does that p-value have to be before we reject the null and conclude the alternate is true? Well, we have this um, alpha. This is the Greek letter lowercase alpha. It looks like a little fishy. Start at the upper right, make a left, uh, make a, you know, down and to the left, a loop, down, there's an alpha. That's called a level of significance. And you'll find that alpha is kind of, kind of sometimes like a complement to C, the confidence level. Don't confuse the two. Usually, we default to 5% unless told otherwise. So if I don't tell you what alpha to use in a problem, just go with 5%. That's kind of a standard number in statistics. If your p-value, if the probability of getting the results you got or something more extreme, assuming the null hypothesis is true, is less than or equal to alpha, then you reject the null, conclude that the alternative is true, or at least that you have sufficient evidence to support it. If the p-value is not greater than alpha, I'm sorry, is greater than alpha, then you fail to reject the null, and there is not enough evidence to conclude the alternative is true. So in our textbook, P is less than or equal to alpha, reject the null. If P is greater than alpha, fail to reject the null. Again, um, if um, you're claiming the null hypothesis, okay, now they're going with what's called the claim. And in this book, they do things differently. They make a claim. And based on where the equal sign is, if it, going to be difficult to, we're, we're going to do things a little bit differently in the book because, you know, FRL, but you'll, it, don't worry, it will make sense to you. Here's the thing you're going to, the only thing you're going to remember from this statistics class in five years. If P is low, reject the hoe. If P is low, lower than alpha, you're gonna reject the null hypothesis. That's how you're gonna remember it. If P is low and low by definition is lower than alpha, your significance level, P is low, reject the hoe. Now, you could be wrong. There's two types of errors called a type one error and a type two error. A type one error is when the null is true, but you got a fluky sample that caused you to reject it. And there's a, you know, if alpha is 5%, there's a 5% chance that that could happen. And a type, so a null, a type one error occurs when the null is true. A type two error occurs if the alternate is true. 
and you fail to reject the null. And there is um, an example problem on uh, page 352 of our current book on type one and type two errors. I like to go with the legal um, thing. We've all heard about innocent until proven guilty. The null hypothesis, we never say that somebody's innocent in court. We find them not guilty. Doesn't mean they didn't do it. It just means that the alternative wasn't proven. <clears throat> so if the alternative hypothesis contains just a less than sign, then we want the area just in the left tail under the curve. And sometimes the curve will be a Z curve, sometimes it'll be a T curve, at least for means and proportions. If the alternative hypothesis contains a strictly greater than sign, we want the upper tail. And if the alternative hypothesis contains a not equal to sign, it's gonna be either of these two tails. So you add the two tails together and see if that is less than alpha. So that is a lot of information to get through in, in one sitting. I totally get that. The key things are knowing um, how to write a null hypothesis and how to write an alternative hypothesis. A null always has the equal sign and it's what you're trying to disprove. And the alternative has a um, greater than, less than, or not equal. And it's what you're trying to gather evidence in favor of. Then you have to know a p-value. The p-value is the probability of getting the results you got, your sample results, or something more extreme, assuming the null is true. And that means that the curve is centered at the value in the null hypothesis. So if these are my hypotheses, I center my curve at mu equals 10 right here. And then I want to gather evidence, I would gather a sample. And if that sample is right here, just to the right of 10, just a smidge, you can see the probability of getting that result or something more extreme would be all this area to the right would be much more than 5%. P is not low, I don't reject the hoe. I failed to reject this, conclude there is not enough evidence to support this. Because it's pretty likely that if mu is exactly 10, uh, that I would get a sample of 10.1. However, if my sample is way over here, then the probability of getting that sample assuming mu is 10, you can see it's really small, maybe less than 5%, then I would say, eh, I'm not gonna go with the fluky sample. I'm not gonna go with the type one error. I mean, it's good. that's why it's an error, you're wrong. But I'm gonna conclude that the sample that is so unlikely that I would get that sample, if this is true, that I'm gonna say it's not true. I'm gonna reject that and conclude that this is true. I'm gonna conclude that the curve is actually centered over here more, because that would make the probability of getting the results I got significantly more likely. If P is low, and by low we mean lower than alpha, the result is unlikely to occur by chance. So we're gonna conclude that the null is wrong and go with the alternative. In class, we'll do some um, example problems. And then let's look at page 353 and 357. So 353. If we're trying to make a hypothesis about mu, our test statistic is X bar, and we're going to use eat and convert that either to a Z or a T score and see how see what the results are. 
if we're trying to learn about a population parameter P, our test statistic is going to be P hat, the sample proportion, and we'll use a Z statistic. And we're not going to cover this section here, but if you're trying to determine what the, um, you're trying to make a hypothesis about a variance or a standard D, um, you would calculate the sample variance or standard D. And then we would use what's called a chi-squared test, which if we have time in these Rona-soaked days, um, we'll use the chi-squared test for another purpose. So to get out of today, <clears throat> how do you write a null and alternate hypothesis? What is the p-value? What does it tell you? What is alpha your level of significance? Then we'll be solving some problems. So that's enough for this lesson. Have a great day.